good morning everyone. Uh, so, uh, thank you Alessandra and uh, let me thank the Department of Political and Social Sciences for, for this invitation uh, um, which I really welcome it uh, as it gives us the chance to exchange uh, some uh, lines of, of, of research uh, and uh, perhaps a research agenda um, for the future. So, uh, as you can see from the title um, of this presentation, uh, the, you know, the object um, of this presentation is contract farming. Um, um, you know, in many ways, you know, the seminar is trying to uh, interrogate um, um, what do we mean basically by, by contract farming and, um, and the claim made by you know, big international organizations like FAO or the World Bank that contract farming uh, does represent uh, a form of inclusive development. So this is the main idea we will be trying to discuss. Uh, um, and I, I will try then later on to provide a, a sort of a critique. So basically, again, we're trying to interrogate the role of contract farming uh, as a form of uh, inclusive development, um, and, and we're trying to do so in two countries, like in Tanzania and, uh, and Uganda. Um, let me just give you a sense of why did I choose this, these two, two countries and these two case studies that I would explore uh, further. Well, the first question comes from the fact that Uganda and Tanzania have been at, at the center of uh, huge flows of foreign direct investments. Actually, they are, if we exclude um, the oil economies of Africa, they are the countries that have uh, larger flows of foreign direct investments. Uh, so they have been at the core, uh, not only of foreign direct investment, but also of uh, this wave of large-scale uh, land acquisitions, what people call land grabs. Right? So, um, Uganda and Tanzania are a particular epicenter of, uh, of processes of change and transformation uh, that are uh, ongoing uh, in the continent. Um, so, here we have a little bit the research rationale, right? Uh, this, um, I mean, there are some points that I just want to, to, to make. One uh, is that there has been a revival of contract farming. Of course, when we talk of contract farming, we are not talking of anything new. Contract farming existed uh, a long time ago, um, but there has been a particular revival of interest by you know, um, global development agencies and uh, um, you know, African governments in uh, smallholders integration uh, in uh, what they call global agricultural value chains. And the claim is that by integrating farmers in, uh, in these value chains, well, we can, solve, uh, we can solve the problem of poverty, we can create dynamics of inclusive development, we can redistribute wealth, and so on. Um, there is also, again, um, I mean, I'm also trying to engage with arguments that instead see um, the key cause of poverty in Africa um, in the lack of uh, registered, uh, titled land markets. Mm -hmm. right? Meaning that, again, um, in, in world, especially World Bank economists um, argue that the key cause of poverty uh, is in the lack of formalized land markets. In other words, there is too much informality, they argue. We need to formalize uh, land markets, we need to, for, to, to, to give title to land, and in doing so, uh, that's the argument they make, we can uh, you know, give life into a dead body, to quote Hernando de Soto, the Peruvian economist who has been uh, the key uh, player in this debate. Um, it's particularly in interesting to explore these claims in Uganda and Tanzania because the majority of the population in these two countries uh, live out of agriculture. So their livelihoods are prevalently agricultural, right? So we, we can really uh, use this case study as, a, as an interesting entry point into these debates because, uh, again, when you have a, a large uh, agricultural population, you can uh, kind of instill in the debate some sociological analysis that go beyond uh, an understanding of the peasantry as a unitary class subject, right? Um, uh, finally, uh, and this is uh, very important, you know, in the context of land grabs, um, 
I mean, you are familiar, I guess, with, with, with this wave of, of, uh, of land acquisitions. I mean, land acquisition has been, to a certain extent, successful if we look at the millions of actors they have uh, take over. Um, but land grabs have also been resisted, have been contested um, through, for example, global campaigns. They also encountered significant um, difficulties in, in the implementations of the project. Many projects had bureaucratic problems, so other, other projects had logistics, many other projects were on paper but not uh, in reality, right? Uh, but again, um, whether we see land grab as a positive or a negative thing, it's undeniable that since 2008-2009 there have been huge global campaigns um, kind of contesting the displacing and dispossessing effects of land grabs, right? Basically, um, peasants organizations, transnational agrarian movements and civil society organizations started to question um, uh, the viability of this uh, model of investment, right? Um, and so again, like if you look at media of the last uh, decade or so, well, you'll see that land grabs are increasingly associated with uh, human rights violations, are associated with evictions, associated with um, uh, you know sometimes extra legal violence by the state, uh, and so on and so forth. Right. So um, there has been a substantial uh, opposition to grabs. So it is in this particular context that we see this revival of contract farming as an alternative to land grabs. Yeah? That's the argument. The argument is that we need to go towards more inclusive forms of development and contract farming uh, you know, uh, uh, represents this kind of uh, uh, model of development that international financial institutions are trying to promote. Uh, so what, what, basically what I want to try and explore is uh, if these claims are, uh, you know, uh, true, and to what extent is that this can be uh, criticized. A final element that gives a little bit of sense of the academic relevance and significance of, the, of this presentation comes from the fact that um, sugarcane, that's the contract farming case we are looking at, uh, is booming in Africa. It's booming along with the other uh, four or five uh, crops, uh, like soya, like cotton, like maize, uh, and this, these crops have been identified uh, by the World Bank uh, in a very famous report of 2009-2010 called Awakening the Sleeping Giant, which gives you a sense of you know, the, the language uh, that the bank is trying to mobilize. Uh, and another one previously uh, called um, Rising Global Interest in Farmland. So in this, in this report, um, the World Bank is depicting Africa as the new frontier. They even you know, identify a, a geoecological uh, area, uh, which is the Guinea Savanna, which it's a very old uh, term, a colonial term, the Guinea Savanna, which basically says that it's all, all Africa is in the Guinea Savanna, from West Africa to, to Mozambique. Um, so basically, again, the World Bank is, and World Bank you know, and big donors institutions are pushing for uh, the particular uh, spreading of these crops. Why? Well, because in their view, they have a particular potential in this, uh, uh, in this, in this area. Uh, where am I doing these two studies? These two, two case studies are, uh, the first one is, is in Uganda, uh, at Kakira Sugar Works, uh, which is uh, the largest sugar producer of the country, very close to the Victoria, uh, Victoria Lake. Um, and the other one is uh, the Kilombero Sugar Company, company in the Morogoro region of Tanzania. Um, these two case studies again have been selected because they look pretty much the same. Uh, they are both part of what scholars call um, uh, nucleus estate plus of grower schemes, meaning that this model of development is based on a big plantation, a big estate managed by the company, which is 10,000 hectares in both cases. But in addition to that, you have substantial numbers of what they call outgrowers, which are basically producers that produce for the company uh, through a contract. And the contract generally establishes timing for delivery of, of cane, the quantities, the prices, and so on. 
Um, so it is this particular model we are going to discuss today. So we are not discussing contract farming in general. We are discussing this particular model that is being promoted as a new avenue for uh, inclusive rural development. So a big sh sugarcane plantation managed by the company, uh, meaning, uh, you know, meaning uh, machineries, uh, chemicals, uh, and all, all the other techniques that are used in large-scale plantation. They are not connected to two companies. No, the companies are not connected. Yes. But the pattern is... Uh, the pattern is exactly the same. Um, so that's why I mean, I'll give you a little bit of details about that. Uh, so um, Kagira Sugar Works is interesting because it's owned by a family which is the, the, the most uh, affluent family in Uganda. And it's a family of Ugandan, of, sorry, of Indian origins, the Madvani. And I'll give you later on a little bit of history about how it came out. And the second case in Tanzania is instead uh, um, owned by Lovo Sugar. Lovo Sugar is uh, the largest uh, sugar producer uh, in Africa uh, and is a South African company. Uh, recently, 48% uh, of, of its shares have been purchased by British Associated Foods, which is one of the largest food conglomerates in the world. So this is the rationale behind this research and, and a little bit of geography. So this is, a, yeah, yeah, this is, um, I mean, this slide talks of what I was telling you before, right? So in the last uh, decade, um, and this is even expanding, again, Uganda and Tanzania have really attracted huge flows of, so it's particularly interesting to see uh, what are the implications of these investments, what are the dynamics of agrarian change that these um, investments trickle it, right? Um, uh, again, this is a slide that gives you a sense of, of, of the sugarcane boom. Huh? Mm -hmm. So, um, if you give a look uh, carefully at data, um, uh, Eastern and Southern Africa are increasingly becoming, uh, so to speak, dominated by sugarcane, uh, which is becoming, uh, uh, for example, in the case of Uganda, it has become, after uh, many years, uh, the first crop uh, being produced in the country, which even uh, replaced the banana plantain, which was the staple food for generation, right? And, and of course, you know, in this uh, in this sugarcane boom, we see a significant role of uh, BRICS countries, right? Uh, so, for example, Brazil has a very important role in sugarcane in Mozambique. Uh, if we take South Africa, well, South Africa is really the leader in sugarcane production. Uh, and it expanded its uh, um, presence of, of sugarcane in, in many countries. So, you know, you can see in this, in this, in this map uh, some of the key plants. So basically, the, the key point I'm making through, through this slide is that South African companies, this is Ilovo in particular, is acquiring a monopolistic position in other countries, up to the point that Ilovo can control, for example, 60% of uh, Zambia's sugar production, uh, more or less 100% of, uh, of Lesotho, 70% uh, in Malawi. So you understand that you know, this movement of South African Corporation North, uh, which started during the apartheid, right? Remember when, when apartheid was ending, uh, a lot of South African farmers were trekking north, right? Uh, because they were getting out of, 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 you know, of the constraints that, um, that they were experiencing in the country. They were starting to move in the uh, you know, in, in, um, in surrounding countries, especially like Mozambique. Uh, again, this is just to give you a sense of what's happening now. Um, in this context, um, South Africa, uh, sorry, uh, Tanzania and Uganda are becoming the center also of large scale infrastructural investments, right? As is the case of the Southern Agricultural Growth Corridor of Tanzania, which is a, a mega infrastructural. Uh, sort of investments that tries to connect agricultural corridors to international markets, right? So basically it is expanding the reach of agribusiness capital in areas that were previously out of its control, right? Or uh, say, it, say it otherwise, it's making uh, you know, the extraction of surplus from the countryside much easier, right? Because it's creating uh, you know, railways, roads that connect Right? And, and you can see who are the, <laughs> the players behind these infrastructural investments. We have others, not only in Tanzania, there is a big uh, agricultural uh, investment in Kenya too, called LAPSET, 
uh, and also Uganda as a whole series of uh, infrastructural investments being funded especially by China. Right. So we see uh, how in Africa you see the, the politics of infrastructure is becoming really uh, you know, key uh, on, the, on the agenda. And of course we see USA, but we at the same time we see huge food corporations like Monsanto, Syngenta, blah, blah, blah. Right. So let's get back to contract farming. With this. Let's start with the definition. So, um, as I said, um, so this is a definition that uh, um, it's provided by um, Michael, uh, sorry, Michael Watson and, and Peter Little in this uh, fantastic book, book that's called Living Under Contract. This book is of the 1994, but still somehow the Bible of because there was this boom of contract farming initiatives in the 90s, but then later on there was sort of there was not, not, not anymore this emphasis. So let's give this definition. So I use this definition uh, which sees contract farming as a form as a form of uh, vertical coordination between growers and buyers or processors that directly shape production decisions through contractually specifying markets, obligations by volume, value, quality, and at times advanced price determination. Provide specific inputs and exercise some control at the point of production. Right? So basically, you know, contract farming is a, is a form of uh, coordinating uh, agricultural production by integrating farmers in the mechanisms of not only production, but of course also, again, uh, processing and so on. But again, it's important that we start to understand that this coordination is vertical, it's not horizontal. So, in, you know, prices, inputs and so on, you know, all these uh, key variables are controlled by the company. So, it's the company that establishes the price that, uh, that, that sugar cane, uh, at, at the, the price at which sugar cane needs to be purchased, it's the company that established what kind of fertilizers they need to use, it's the company that established what kind of things they need to use. Right. So it's really uh, an expansion of control of farmers' production in, um, uh, in, in Africa. Now again, as I was saying before, uh, contract farming is not new. So for example, w the first experience of contract farming was in Sudan with the Gezira irrigation scheme in 1920s in which uh, farmers were contracted to grow cotton under a specific uh, uh, land tenancy agreement. Um, we have other examples in Tanzania, uh, which were documented by Alvin <coughs> Cliff, for example, including the Tanganyika Agricultural Corporation. So, in other words, contract farming has a colonial origin. Uh, and it was used in the... I mean, that's what we will be seeing before, uh, we'll be seeing later on. And also we have the, the outgrower schemes at Kagira Sugar Works, so also Kakira Sugar Work was one of the first uh, large-scale plantations in the country, established in the 1920s, and that they were starting outgrower schemes just 20 or 30 years after. Uh, so uh, I will later get back to this point because I think that um, you know, giving a look at history, at the genealogy of contract farming uh, in Africa is extremely important before we engage with uh, uh, sort of epiphenomenal uh, understanding of, of contract. So, um, a little bit of literature here. Um, um, so, uh, again, I'm referring to, to Michael Watts here. So, according to Michael Watts, contract farming was essentially a pa part of a wider strategy of corporate outsourcing. In other words, uh, you know, uh, it's a strategy in which uh, agri uh, industrial agriculture uh, expands its control over farmers' agricultural labor. Uh, and produce at cheaper cost than what would be required by producing it that, in, itself, right? So in, in Michael Watt's understanding of contract farmers, he defines them as disguised proletarians. So in other words, for Michael Watt's uh, contract farmers are, are just uh, proletarian. They are disguised, they are masked, right? Uh, you cannot really see uh, that they are uh, just working. You have then other, um, other authors, uh, like Glover, who have been uh, trying to understand so, um, what happens uh, with, in contract farming when we shift from a crop to another one. So they're trying to understand what are the key factors shaping the success or failure of contract farming. So some people start to say, oh, it depends from the crop. Other people start to say, oh, it depends from land tenure systems. 
Someone else started to say, well, yes, but you need to have particular pricing policies in place if you want uh, that this strategy is successful. I mean, a whole series of questions. Also very important is the question of monopsony or monopoly of the company vis-à-vis -vis the, uh, the farm, right? So all these questions were um, um, central in debates. Again, these are debates, as you can see, from the dates of publications of the early 90s. Uh, other people have, uh, have uh, you know, focused on the role that growers' associations should play uh, in, this, in this context. Like, what's, what's their bargaining power, right? Um, and so on, and, and, and the existence of um, alternative uh, livelihood uh, strategies, or um, other people have, uh, other scholars have been, uh, you know, uh, pointing to the significance of gender relations in contract farming, right? In other words, because contract farming is mostly based on work uh, by family members, the gender and generational dynamics are also very important, right? Um, and so, um, you know, so the, the success of these debates has been to frame the question of contract farming in relation to the question of development, right? Under, so the scholars were asking, under what conditions, under what conditions here we mean political, economic, ecological, and, and under what circumstances can contract farming play uh, a, a role that can be sort of enhancing development rather than constraining? So, uh, they were trying to understand what is it that leads to inclusive development rather than increasing dependence, right? So that's... Um, uh, and, and again, we come a little bit to, to more recent debates and claims, uh, especially by neoclassical and neo-institutional economics, who have been literally assaulting the topic, uh, seeing it as an opportunity, and they were basically claiming that uh, contract farming outgrow schemes improve the productivity of farmers. Why? Well, because um, they reduce the risk. Why? Well, because they, you see, the big problem for farmers has always been the market. And here it is, the market. We provide it. You know, we provide it. We, we give them market security. I mean, these this are the arguments, of course. So they, they argue that uh, this relationship enhances the circulation of inputs, right? Uh, and therefore, you see, this has been a big plight by, by, by farmers. Um, and again, uh, all this literature has been looking at this organizational and technological innovation surrounding contract farming, um, which in their view reduces transaction costs, um, and blah, blah, blah. I don't want to leave you too many of these economics um, uh, arguments. Uh, and again, we finally come to, to, to the recent debates, where the World Bank sees it as an instrument to expand investments uh, to the poor, uh, you know, the, world, the FAO sees it as a, as a form of a collaborative business model. Scholars of uh, this, or uh, uh, um, I mean, a kind of pro uh, agribusiness persuasion, look it as an inclusive business model. Uh, we have, uh, you know, also very famous scholars like Lorenzo Cotula, who have, I mean, they have been understanding contract farming as an alternative to land grabbing. Why? Well, because it, they argue it's less harmful and it does not involve dispossession, right? So that's, um, that's, that's the argument. And then we finally have people saying, this is a very good model because it leaves smallholders in control of their land while at the same time they can deliver up, right? So we have a very solid uh, set of uh, you know, arguments. Um, now, just to start a little bit uh, engaging with these claims, um, well, the first point that we need to, to understand when we, we deal with contract farming that a lot of emphasis has been placed to connecting farmers to the market. So, to the elements of connection, right? Assuming that they are disconnected. Uh, now, this is not uh, entirely wrong, but the problem is that uh, they are not looking at markets themselves, but just uh, to the connection uh, to the market, meaning that Again, they, they see a limit market as a, as a panacea of all rural problems. Say, you have a problem, and you need rural markets. Uh, you, you have a problem, and you need land markets. You know, in some ways, connected to markets. But few people have uh, eventually into an analysis of what are markets, right? So in this analysis, I use Polanyi uh, argument who explains and shows how, well, markets uh, are historical institutions. They are not just, they do not emerge out of a vacuum. 
right? And this, uh, you know, and, and, and the historical nature of, of this institution allow us to understand the degree of embeddedness of farmers within these markets, right? So, to what extent they are included into vertical uh, relations, uh, to what extent they are uh, uh, subjected to, to dependence and so on, right? So, markets uh, are historical institutions but you know, the way in which they are framed makes us understand what is the position of farmers within these markets, right? So markets are also framed through hierarchies. I mean, coming back to, to Ariet uh, Senna yesterday, so yeah, hierarchies in the countryside are still uh, uh, very much in control. Um, but I would like also to move to another argument, that's uh, the argument made by a famous uh, scholar of, of, of agrarian change, Jairus Banaji. Right? Jairus Banaji is an Indian scholar, he's a Marxist scholar, uh, who has actually been telling us, well, yes, many, many of the proponents of, of contract farming have been uh, um, focusing on the organizational innovations, but, uh, but we need to understand that contracts, in his view, are a legal fiction. So he uses Marx's understanding of workers' contract uh, as a legal fiction that masked, uh, in the end, the domination of labor by capital. So by, uh, Banaji expands this understanding of Marx of, you know, of, uh, of uh, 19th century contracts to the contemporary countryside, right? Showing that basically farmers, I mean, it's, it's a point, is pushing us to ask a, a very important question. Are farmers free to, to join these markets? How does it happen? That, that they uh, uh, join these markets. And again, uh, there is this um, kind of 19th century rhetoric of, of free contracts that has been uh, you know, exposed by Marx. Um, and, and I find this useful because then when you give a look at what's happening on the ground, well, these contracts are all but free. <laughs> these are contracts in which power relations really play a huge role. So just let me give you an example so that I push this example further. Um, you know, contract, uh, I mean, sugarcane farmers, um, because I asked them, so why did you join the scheme? Uh, why did you join this, uh, this investment uh, model? And the, the answer I was always given was that, um, so the boom of, of this contract farming scheme is already in the 90s. Huh? So they were telling me basically that, again, and there's a lot of uh, literature, on the fact that you know structural adjustment programs had really um, devastated the capacity of states to pro provide inputs, provide extension services, provide any sort of uh, knowledge or know-how to to the countryside. So when a farmer wants to let's say uh, go more commercial, uh, uh, the only direction he has to look at is to the private sector. So. We need to understand that there is no public sector there, and even if you want a little bit of uh, sort of agricultural extension services um, of any sort, uh, or if you want to access uh, the market of fertilizers, again, we are not deciding uh, <laughs> whether this is good or bad, but if you want to do so, the only actor you can look at is the private sector. Right? And this is important because we often understand, oh no, the farmers should not go for for uh, fertilizer, yes, of course we know <laughs> that this is bad, but uh, but many farmers in, in you know in this very uh, constrained situation, well, they are looking for more uh, output, not necessarily for a better environment. Of course, we know that this will be devastating. I mean, look, that's what I would like to uh, to highlight. But we also need to understand that farmers uh, in these conditions are, in, are have a very limited portfolio of choices, right? Um, so, um, so basically my question is that I see a lot of these debates and literature emerging really not asking the right question. I mean, I, I'm interested in some of this literature, but, um, but I'm, I'm more interested in asking, uh, again, the question of how smallholders mediate impacts of global markets and, and demands and pressures uh, coming from, from agribusiness, uh, from local elites uh, and, 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 and entrepreneurs. Um, I'm also asking questions of like what kind of agrarian systems and livelihood strategies have resulted from the adoption of sugarcane, what patterns of land ownership uh, has this development model uh, triggered, and again, a fu fundamental question is what have been the conditions of existence of th those farmers uh, that have become entirely dependent on sugarcane. Uh, 
But again, the story is not over because uh, as, the, as we have many farmers that join this team, we have uh, even more farmers that are left behind. Right? Why? Well, because in many cases they cannot even afford those basic elements that allows them to join the scheme. Right? And, and I should say this is the overwhelming majority of farmers in both Uganda and Tanzania who are prevalently subsistence farmers. So when are you asking a farmer that has been producing mostly for subsistence? Uh, again, we, know, we need to know that subsistence here is not a static. Uh, occurrence. Uh, subsistence means that you, the, the, and also subsistence does not mean that you are not producing a, uh, a surplus. They are producing surplus, but they are not investing this surplus in a capitalist way, right? If you are producing a lot of, uh, let's say, maize, you don't sell it in, uh, immediately because the price is high. You store it, right? So this is the kind of farmer we are dealing with. So farmers that are not looking necessarily for, uh, for profits, right? Uh, but they are more looking at how do you reproduce the house, which is more important. Like, you, know, you, you learn this when you do a little bit of research in pastoralist societies. Right? When you say, so you are a pastoralist, why don't you sell this cow? Well, the, the, the pastoralist will tell you, uh, this cow is my bank. I cannot sell my bank. <laughs> this is my long-term security. Right? So we understand that the mentality of farmers in countries like Uganda and Tanzania is not necessarily the mentality of uh, farmers that are already kind of commercialized and that engaging in farming with, uh, with, uh, with this idea. So again, the, the final question I'm also asking is how sugarcane sugar uh, farming is transforming the landscape right? and, and the countryside? Because again, with, 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 with sugarcane farming we are talking of monocropping of really a very an incredibly invasive um, Invasive here, not only from the point of view of chemicals, but spatially invasive. Like the space in, um, in, in these two regions that I've been uh, studying has been incredibly transformed. Just to give you a sense, Buzoga, the, the area in Uganda, uh, was previously known to be the breadbasket of the country. Um, imagine that so much maize was produced in the region that was Use it to be um, uh, to be was used for humanitarian operations in Somalia, uh, in uh, in Central Africa. So it was really the uh, the bus the bread basket of the country. And if you go now, you see only sugar cane. Right? You only see sugar cane up to the point that you know scholars have started to use the word uh, sugar belt, right? A little bit like cane sugar belt that has a lar and a longer history. So, in order to ask this question, um, I, I find very useful the, the tools, the analytical tools and theories and, and methodologies provided by Critical Agrarian Studies, uh, which uh, have been uh, developing in the last decade uh, or so under the push of, uh, of June Boris uh, and, and the Journal of Pesa Studies. Of course, he's not the only one, but uh, I, uh, we should give uh, him credit to, to reintroduce in this debate this work, right? Critical agrarian study, which of course we know is an attempt to re, re, uh, you know, re um, you know the debates over modes of production, uh, debates over uh, agrarian, you know, the agrarian questions, uh, but uh, nowadays instilled with more uh, political ecology and political sociology, right? In other words, it's not just the agrarian question of capital we are interested in, <laughs> we are not only interested in, in how capital uh, uh, reproduces itself, right? we are also interested in understanding what's the role of farms in all that. And, and we know that uh, often, um, I mean, some uh, scholars of Marxist persuasion, including me, uh, but uh, they tend to, uh, you know, to, to assume a certain path of development, ignoring whatever force stays, uh, you know, in between. Right? And, and they often ignore um, you know, the agency of, um, you know, of farmers, right? So, um, sorry, I'm very bad at this. So, again, I'm using a mix of uh, political economy, political ecology, and political sociology uh, to address this question, right? To, to, to answer this question, as I don't see much, uh, 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 much support, right, available in other analytical or epistemic approaches, right? Uh, and, and these are particularly important because 
um, you know, the agrarian political economy approach it really allows us to, to ask the, the classical agrarian questions like uh, you know, who owns what, who does what, who gets what and how, you know, how the surplus is reinvested. But then we have questions of uh, political ecology that are equally important to understand how capital and, and people reproduce themselves and therefore their relationship with nature, right? Uh, and, and again, this starts from Marx, but um, now uh, these approaches to issues of uh, domination of, of nature, uh, it's interesting because, um, you know, Jason Moore, uh, does not just talk of domination of nature or exploitation of nature. He talks of how capital is not just exploiting nature, it's curbing it towards its aims, right? Um, it's not just exploiting water, it's using water to have, uh, you know, to have hydroelectrical energies. It's using soil uh, and all other elements of nature with particular uh, finality, right? So it's not just about exploitation. And, and this is important because we sugar cane, you cannot go without this uh, huge amounts of energy why, and huge amounts of water. So bear in mind that in order to refine sugar, you need uh, uh, hectoliters of water, right? Of boiling water that needs to be uh, poured on the sugar cane once it has been uh, kind of grinded. Uh, so, you know, it, uh, these elements of nature or natural resources are are extremely important and therefore we cannot. And finally, again, the question of political sociology, I mean, it, it really allows us to understand, like, so what are farmers' responses? How farmers act in these uh, constrained circumstances? You know, how, how do they act in order to face these challenges? Do they have some sort of space of maneuvering or are they just deemed uh, right, to, to stay in this situation? Right? What's, in the other words, we are asking the question, what's the agency of farmers? Right? Um, and this is important again because you, you need to understand that we're talking of countries like Uganda and Tanzania where, especially in the second, farmers were uh, a political subject. Uh, especially in, in, in the Ujamaa project of Nyerere, uh, farmers were uh, a political constituent, right? And, and, and so imagining, I mean, of course we know that the organization of farmers, the organization of peasants that existed before under the cooperative model, um, well, they were very important. Again, like bear in mind, for example, that from 1963 to 1971, a country like Uganda that was based on this cooperative model uh, had rates of growth uh, similar to East Asian tigers uh, from 1963 to 1971. So it was a success model. And this is important to bear in mind because we are often told today, every time you talk of some sort of cooperation or uh, some sort of, you know, to use a word that Julian like, you know, reciprocity or whatever, um, we, we say that, we, we are told that you know, this is obsolete, as a, it's an inefficient model, right? We are provided with all sorts of, um, you know, economic argument to say this is not a model that works. Uh, because it's state-led, because it's inefficient, blah, blah. Of course, these inefficiencies have existed, um, but we, at the same time, need to understand that in some cases, uh, where you had the significant uh, farmers' organization that could have a voice in the process, well, this uh, was very important. So, for example, in Tanzania, the cooperative model was the only successful model that allowed to provide inputs and services to huge numbers of farmers that were scattered. Right, so uh, I don't see any other instruments for a poor country emerging out of colonialism to you know to try and harness their uh, you know labor energies and any sort of. So this is a little bit the kind of um, you know analytical framework uh, uh, I'm using. Uh, I mean I don't want to go a little bit too much, but just to give you again a bit a sense of how history is important. Um, again, this is very important because. Um, so you need to know that um, so during colonialism, um, if we take, for example, three countries in Eastern Africa, like uh, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, uh, we often think about transformations, uh, agrarian change in these countries, as everything is the same. Right? There is this sort of assumption that Africa is all the same, right? um, which is, of course, very, uh, I say, banal. But it's important to understand, for example, that in Kenya, you had the promotion of large-scale farming, uh, mostly owned by white people, right? So in Kenya, you had uh, a pattern of settlements of 
white colonialist, a little bit like like South Africa, right, where you had substantial involvement of, uh, and you know, in Kenya, smallholder production was even banned, huh? like in South Africa, right? Well, in South Africa it was not banned, but the, the, the conditions of production were so so absurd that, that you know, black smallholders in South Africa could not compete with large scale. Uh, plantations owned by whites, right? Um, in Tanzania, instead, it's interesting because we have a more hybrid model, um, right? We have a, a part of development that has been based upon large-scale agriculture, but then at the same time you have a huge involvement of smallholders, which is not the case in Kenya. And finally, you know, on the other, at, the other, at the other end of the spectrum, we see Uganda, where all the large-scale plantations that were uh, um, instituted in, in, the, in the early years of colonialism, uh, uh, they, in many cases, failed. So, in Uganda, you have a much more complicated environment, uh, much less, uh, I mean, much, yes, much, much less support by the state, and you had the white uh, capitalists, which were, you know, much less confident in their possibility of success. So you have, uh, uh, you know, Uganda uh, as a particular case where the process of production of surplus value and extraction of surplus value was based upon smallholders. Uh -huh. So you see the difference, uh, and, 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 and you know, and this is, I mean, these differences are visible up, up to now. You go, you travel across Uganda, and you see a multitude of small-scale uh, family farmers sort of uh, production. If you go to Kenya, on the highlands, for example, you only see fenced lands. You only see land enclosures, which is something you don't see in the Ugandan countries. Right? So I think these are um, all elements that are important. Just again, a, a passage on history. Um, you know, it's important that, uh, to note that, uh, again, in the Ugandan case, the, the, the agrarian structure was not the one we are used to see I don't know, in other countries, like uh, in other African countries, but here you have a strong presence of Indians. Uh, uh, say, why Indians in, in, in Eastern Africa, in Southern Africa? Well, they were first uh, you know, imported as coolies, right? Porters, right? Because in order to build uh, railways and so on, majority of Africans were attached to their land. It was not easy to dispossess them. So they had to look for uh, labor coming from China and India. So future generations of the schoolies started to remain in the country rather than go back to, 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 you know, to India. And, and step by step, you had the emergence of what people now call family, uh, family firms, not family farms, uh, based upon, again, this, um, this um, Kind of, kind of familiar sort of management of um, of the firm, and now these family firms uh, have grown up to kind of uh, regional conglomerates. Right? So this group of, I'm talking about, Matvani, that owns Kadira Sugar Works, well, is the largest producer of the of sugar in the country. It has investments in energies, in uh, flowers, in infrastructure. So it's it's a, it's it's really a, a an empire in, in Eastern Africa. So we understand how really, um, you know, these transformations have, have, have made a lot of sense. Um, um, I want to just give you, um, again, another uh, little um, uh, historical kind of um, trajectory of, of, of our growing schemes, um, so that we understand that, um, Again, I'm trying to, to dig into the past because it's important that we, we understand how contract farming was not just a, an instrument to extract value, but was also at the same time an instrument to control farmers. And this is very important because, uh, you know, if we try to understand how historical uh, circumstances have changed, well, we understand, for example, that contract farming in Uganda was used in the first phase to bypass the limitations to uh, holding acquisition to the company, right? So, the, I mean, even under colonialism, you had ceilings, right? You you could not get more land than, than what what is allowed. So, companies uh, were using contract farming to expand their production without expanding land control. So, it was very astute. Huh? But at the same time, and this is very important, uh, contract farming uh, is understood as. Um, you know, as an instrument that was meant 
to demobilize the countryside. So bear in mind, again, both in Uganda and Tanzania, you had a lot of rural contestation. Uh, you had the contestation that was taking any forms. Uh, again, let's bear in mind that Uganda is the largest Kulak formation in Africa. Uh, so when we talk of Kulaks, we talk generally of uh, rich peasants. Uh, um, and, 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 and this rich peasantry was also the main social constituency behind the uh, anti-colonial struggles. Uh, and so, you know, we, we really understand how um, contract farming was used to demobilize a countryside that at that moment was rioting, both in Uganda and Tanzania. So, we understand that, again, there was a political intention, right, to bring uh, to include, right, and integrate some farmers under specific control, right? Um, and then at the same time it was uh, an instrument to penetrate a country, the countryside, which was very difficult to be, to be, you know, uh, uh, read, right? In a sense to be, you know, in, in Foucauldian terms, it was very difficult to, to control, to, to, to make it legible. Uh, so, um, why? Well, because uh, be, because colonial governance was well, was uneven according to region and was based on towns. And when it expanded in the countryside, it used the existing powers, right? Which were the traditional authorities that Africans had uh, for decades, right? For centuries. Um, another element in this political, uh, in this explanation of the political character of contract farming comes in the 90s, when we see this new boom of contract farming. So, um, if one digs a little bit into the, uh, the discourses and narratives used by, by the promoters, well, we see that uh, contract farming was very often used to dismantle cooperatives. Uh, why? Well, because, because in contract farming you are uh, pushed to think in individual terms, right? You are an individual. Um, uh, you need to, to deliver your quotas to the company uh, and you had very little uh, chance to, you know, to, to try to develop some sort of collective uh, form of uh, cooperation. Uh, so it was a way to instilling in farmers an individualist and utilitarian mentality. Uh, again, in a context in which the previous experiences were about uh, collective labor, collective inputs, uh, collective production. Again, I'm not saying if this was good or bad, but uh, it's important to notice that uh, the proponents of contract farming were using uh, it in this, uh, uh, in this sense. Uh, and instead, what I see today as uh, characterizing contract farming is that um, you know, many of the contract farmers today, sugarcane contract farmers I've been visiting, um, well, in many ways they have uh, internalized some of the logics of large-scale farming, right? despite them being uh, small-scale producers. To give you an example, uh, the extent and the use of fertilizers. Uh, um, so, uh, it seems to me that in, in, in the particular conjunction we are talking about, um, contract farmers are kind of expanding the agro-extractive logic of large-scale plantations. Uh, um, so it's not. So this is some, in some way. I, I will give a little bit more grounding to this argument. But again, it's. Uh, I think it's it's revealing because it it explain it it, it allows us to see how um, contract farming allows for a new territorialization of a particular division of labor, uh, uh, in which again the, the the positions are vertically structured. Um, and so it's like uh, farmers in this sense are uh, incorporated in, in the metabolism of capital. Um, though again, I, I do not entirely buy into the, the argument that they are disguised proletarians because the fact that you have land, uh, well, does make you a proletarian by definition and also gives uh, some sort of space of maneuvering to differentiate among farmers. If you have a little piece of land, well, you might be suffering. In some cases, when you have a large uh, uh, amount of land available, well, you can, um, of course, try and benefit out of this. So, um, again, um, this is the picture from below uh, of the Kilombero Valley. Um, and so, again, this is, these are just uh, some key features of this nucleus estate plus of grower scheme model that I was talking before. Um, and, and again, there are some features, key features of this model, among which, again, we can see, for example, the high level of 
uh, foreign imports. So it's a model that lives only out of significant flows of, um, of capital, machineries, and so on, which in the end they start to increase debt, uh, debt not only of the states, but also of the companies, and uh, we will see how this trickles down to farmers themselves, right? So the question of debt uh, is a multi scalar in this sense, and, and, and does not only touch states, but more importantly, uh, farmers. Uh, in, in both cases, you have the company uh, occupying a monopolistic uh, and monopsonistic uh, position, uh, meaning, uh, well, they are the only, I mean, the companies are the only actor that is entitled to buy uh, the, sh the sugar cane, right? So, um, you cannot decide to sell to whoever you want. You are obliged. So, when you have one, uh, I mean, there is only a paradox here, because when you produce sugar cane, uh, in such quantities, the only use you can make of this is industrial. I mean, sugarcane, you need to bear in mind that it's an industrial crop, is already integrated in the industrial. So if I'm not happy with the price I'm given, I can't go to someone else and, and say, hey, take it, because <laughs> the other player are mills, right? Uh, so uh, it's not easy to shift to uh, as other farm, for example, you produce some maize you find a market or a middleman don't giving you enough. Well, you can try to travel a little bit far and try to sell it to other prices. With sugar cane, this is not the case. So I think this explains some, in some way why you have so, such a very such a little uh, power of bargaining, right? Despite the fact that, as I will show, uh, in the case of Kakira uh, in Uganda. Um, Farmers provide up to 70% of all the sugar cane that the company processes for refined sugar. So despite... Measure that. Sorry? How do you measure 70% of what? 70% uh, 70 of all the, the sugar cane that the company needs to process into their meal. Mm -hmm. uh, so in other words, 10,000 uh, yes, 10, hectares of the company are able to provide 30% of the sugar cane needed for the mill to operate 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. The remaining part of sugar cane is taken uh, from sugar cane outgrowers. Again, which gives you um, already a clue uh, in the fact that that's what I, I, I want to give you a sense of. Well, it's the fact that um, um, farmers are very much dependent from uh, uh, the mills uh, capacity utilization, right? In other words, these mills are pushed to the limits. You know, their owners want, the, want, want them to work uh, uh, 24 hours a day for nine months a, a year, and in the remaining three months it's because there is too much rain and you cannot process anything. Huh? But they're trying to maximize production. Now the point is that, and this is interesting, this is one of the, of the key findings that I, I, I I kind of research. Well, is the fact that uh, contrary to the claim that uh, the company provides the security of the market, there have been instances in both cases in Tanzania and Uganda where the company refused to pick the, 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 the cane that it had already contracted farms to grow. Huh? Um, and this gives a sense of, uh, of the fact that, um, well, the company argue there is too much sugar coming in. Sugar coming from Brazil, Indonesia, the prices are going down. I do not make enough profits. I, I, don't, I don't harvest your... Um, which is somehow... Okay, I mean, it's somehow strange. But again, it gives you a sense... I mean, we shouldn't buy this argument because the point we should instead highlight, well, is that there are power relations there. And these power relations crystallize into prices. Uh, but also in the fact that despite farmers had all the instruments to well, all the legal instruments to try and, and, and contest the decision of the company, well, they don't do it. They don't do it because, well, they are in this dependent position. And also, I should say, this is perhaps more important, their farmers' association, the, what, what today we call outgrowers' association, are not the same as farmers' associations 30 or 40 years ago, which had a political connotation. In this case, these associations are basically just a sort of a trade union between uh, the company imperatives and, uh, and, and the discipline needed to push the farmers to adjust. So, for example, just to give you a sense, 
Um, again, just some technical details. In order to grow sugar cane, you need 18 months of uh, gestation, and only between 18 and 20 months you start to harvest it. Uh, the company provides a whole set of services so because. Uh, because sugarcane is an industrial crop, you need to plow in a certain way, you need to farrow in a certain way, you need to create these lines in a certain way, which generally are done through machines. So the company offers these services on credit, of course. Um, the point is that after 18 months, the farmer, uh, which needs to keep the plantation going, right, needs to weed, needs to uh, clean it, and, and many other things, after 18 months, it, it, it gets completely indebted. Huh? So, these farmers, and then of course, what does happen? When you have the first uh, uh, harvest, you give it back to the company, and the company starts to deduce the money they own, uh, you owe them, and gives you the rest in two different installments. The first one, on seven, uh, they give you first 70%, and then they call arrears, which then can come after three or four months. Now, the story is not over. Because um, the paradox is that the price that the company establishes um, is variable. So what does the company say? The company say, I'm not giving you a fixed price. I give you, let's say, an orientation of what the price will be, but then the actual calculation includes factoring in market prices. <laughs> Meaning, if the price of sugar has gone down, even though we have signed a contract uh, one year before, I will, uh, I will have you to pay for this decrease. So in other words, this incorporation of farmers, that's why I use the, call, uh, the, the notion of adverse incorporation, this integration of farmers is more uh, you know, on adverse terms because basically, rather than, uh, that's my point, rather than uh, insulating or uh, you know, protecting them against the market oscillations or against the market uh, insecurity, the reality is that they are just actually exposing them. Because, you know, one way, for example, would be, okay, we have a fixed price, whatever it comes, uh, that's the price, rather than having farmers, because then in the majority of cases, you have uh, price of sugar going down. <laughs> so farmers uh, find themselves at a certain point um, not in the position to be able to reproduce themselves, right? Why? Well, because uh, in, in, this actual, uh, in the actual conjuncture, we see rising prices for fuel, and therefore rising prices for fertilizers. So if, if to these key instruments we, we are decreasing uh, price for sugar cane that, uh, by the company, well, we have what you know, people like Bernstein call uh, uh, price uh, squeeze, right? Cost price squeeze, right? Um, which again gives us, uh, I think, uh, a sense of, uh, that's what, what and then also, again, what I was trying to say is that um, when production is subordinated to the capacity utilization of the mill, well, we see that uh, outgrowers are often used as a buffer, <laughs> right? As a buffer to reach maximum production, but if there is extra production, then they are the first to be turned down. Right. So, it's like they are the weak ring in this chain um, and, and therefore they are the first who suffer of any sort of uh, price uh, oscillation. Um, so again, uh, the, the, the outcome of this dynamic is that many cases, in many cases farmers get hugely indebted. Now, um, we were often told uh, that um, for, for, uh, for sugarcane outgrowers, uh, the security for farmers is not land, but is sugar cane. So in other words, if I, if I have a credit, um, the, you know, the, the debtor uh, that has given me a credit is sure that I will pay that, not because of the value of the land, but because of the value of the sugar cane. <laughs> right? But again, in, in many cases, you have farmers, uh, I mean, despite that, you have farmers ending up even losing their land. Because when you have uh, contracted so many debts, right, um, bear also in mind that farmers receive this credit in the case of uh, Uganda, so the Kagira Sugar Works, at 22%. Uh, so it's not a uh, microcredit or it's not a uh, 
subsidized credit is purely commercial credit. <laughs> so 22% for a farmer means you cutting off uh, uh, one fourth uh, of what would be his own revenue. So if we add to this the huge cost of uh, transport they need to face because yes, once you have produced it, you need to, to, to take the, the sugar cane to the mill. You need to, to hire a truck, uh, hire a driver, and uh, buy the fuel and take it to, to the company. So we understand that um, this, you know, the squeezing uh, mechanism um, in, in this case is, uh, is huge. And also, I think it's also very important, the majority of labor used by both the company and small orders is made out of migrant labor. So migrant labor basically comes from very uh, poor areas of both Uganda and Tanzania, um, differentiated according to genders. So for example, just to give you an example, um, a woman uh, weeding uh, in, the, in, the estate, in the company estates, working for seven or eight hours, get 8,000 Ugandan uh, shillings, which are now um, around three dollars. Um, so, again, just to give you a sense of the degree of also exploitation, it that, um, was Barbara Harris-White who wrote uh, an important piece, uh, um, no sorry, it was Bridget Olaplin. So Bridget wrote a fantastic piece on, uh, on, uh, on sugar cane plantation in, uh, in Mozambique, and she was pointing a little bit to some of the same dynamics I was pointing, right? The idea that still at the core of this sugarcane exploitation, well, there is a model of labor that is incredibly exploitative, like the migrant labor, uh, which, again, um, um, has particular instruments of recruitment of, of these people. Uh, people are recruited through the radio, so you have, a, you have a, um, or messages broadcasted through radio, or uh, you know, emissaries of the company going in this very poor areas trying to stimulate right, this, um, this sugarcane uh, migration. This is just an image uh, showing uh, you know, all the cane that is delivered. This is the track below. Then you have a, an instrument that picks the, 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 the cane and starts kind of grinding it. Then all these masses are uh, brought into, you know, into the mill. You have hectoliters uh, of boiling water thrown on it. And then it's in this process of boiling that you have the extraction of sucrose, uh, which uh, after a further process gets uh, crystallized again and, uh, and, and comes into, into, into refined sugar. So just to give you a sense of the boom of sugar. So this is a graph by uh, Kagira Sugar Works. So this is the 1990s. Uh, the, uh, you have the, the, the 20,000... Uh, yeah, this is Uganda. This is Kagira Sugar Works. The lion is the, the image they have. Yes. Or, not Tanzania. Uh, no, not Tanzania. Uh, this is Uganda. Uganda. Yeah. Uh, so you see, uh, you know, this really maps the, the boom of sugar cane, right? And, and you know, it started in the 90s. Why in the 90s? Well, because I mean, in Uganda there has been this, as I told you before, in Uganda you had the majority of sugar cane controlled by Indians. But in 1971, Idi Amin expelled Indians. Huh? And basically, the majority of, of Indians had to leave the country, and you had sugarcane production, production going down. Uh, it's when Museveni gets back to power in the 1986 that he starts to reinvite uh, all, the, you know, all the Indians that had been expelled that were very, uh, you know, very affluent uh, groups of people. Yeah, giving back the land to, not only giving back to land, but also helping them to get World Bank credits to uh, replenish and refurnish the plants that had been uh, uh, left abandoned for you know, 20 years. Right? So you see how, how this skyrocketing uh, cane production uh, you know, uh, affects the area, but most significant is this one. <laughs> Uh, still from Kakira sugar. So you see the green, uh, the green box. So it was very tiny here, right, in, in the 90s. So this is the difference between cane produced by the growers and cane produced by the company. Uh, so uh, you, you see how um, you know it, it shifted massively up to cover. To, nowadays is 74 percent. So what does it mean? 
It means that the company is finding more profitable to, uh, you know, to contract sugarcane production to our growers rather than producing it, uh, producing by, by itself. Huh? And this is the, the question is why is it why is happening? Um, and I think that this has to do with uh, well, with a whole set of issues, but also the fact that um, in many cases the fi financial capital that is backing the company is finding more lucrative to focus on backward and, and, and forward linkages rather than getting involved in production itself, which is a paradox. I mean, it goes against uh, any laws of surplus extraction, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Right, so uh, and so this gives a sense of uh, how the company uh, outsourced, um, you know, sugarcane production um, up to you know depending on, on outdoors for 75 percent of its need, of its uh, you know the, the, the utilization of the milk capacity. Uh, again, I think this is a key finding. Um, it's a key finding because on the one hand, this is a, a trajectory that is being followed elsewhere. And, and this contributes to the boom of sugarcane, right? When, when sugarcane is incorporated in, a, in the existing farming system, right? Um, so I think that's, um, um, I know, finally, again, the second key finding that, I, uh, that emerged out of this, um, you know, of, of this research, well, is that contract, we, cannot, we should not fall into the Manichaean trap as good or bad, right? Uh, because good or bad does not take us anywhere. Uh, rather, I think it's important that we understand a that our growers are socially differentiated. So you have smallholders, but you also have substantially large, large-scale players, right? So of course the effects and implications vary enormously if you are a small player and if you are a, a, a big player, right? So different, despite the fact that of course we agree that the company. Uh, you know, has this vertical relation with any farmer, right? whatever farmer you are, if you're a, a small or a big. But again, the contradiction is not only between uh, outgrowers and the company, it's also within outgrowers, because these outgrowers are socially differentiated. Right? They have uh, different endowments of land, they have, uh, and then again, here the question of class differentiation is not only connected to uh, what kind of position you have, uh, uh, in the uh, in the division of labor, right? Instead, I think that you know again, social differentiation here is affected by, for example, uh, gender relations. Just let me give you an example. If I am a, a polygamist, uh, um, and I have, uh, which is very common in Uganda, and I have four wives, and every wife has four or five children. Uh, well, I can uh, use all this labor force. Uh, in the different pieces of land that I have, uh, and, and I will keep the family working on it. So if I have a, a huge family, so this is uh, Esther Bosserup argument of how demography affects agrarian change, right? How demography and gender relations well, affect uh, uh, the dynamics of agrarian change. So if you, if you have a lot of uh, hands that can work the land, well, you perhaps you can be more successful than others, right? So, you see how the social differentiation uh, issue uh, intersects with questions of gender, questions of demography, and with questions of alternative livelihoods. In other words, if you have a, a job and uh, you are using sugarcane uh, in a more kind of flexible way as not your primary uh, um, you know, um, revenue uh, generating activity, well, you may be a little bit more successful because you can, for example, reinvest part of the of the profits that you have uh, elsewhere in the uh, or some of the income not necessarily a profit in the sugarcane plantation so it shows how all these dynamics of livelihoods gender uh, demography intersect with class dynamics and 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 it's out of this kind of complex mechanism that we um, we see uh, again contract farming um, how it shapes uh, agrarian change uh, and finally, and this is also interesting, well, it comes from the fact that um, basically we have a lot of, I use in this case, Henry Bernstein notion of petty commodity producer, right? Uh, who are they? Well, for Bernstein, petty commodity producers are a sort of a contradictory unity, meaning, um, you know, they are part of capital, part of labor. Uh, they are part of capital because they own a means of production. Um, they are part of labor because they work it themselves, right? 
Um, now, uh, I have an issue with 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 the Henry's definition of um, of commodity producers because I think that when you have food producers, you do not necessarily have a commodity, <laughs> and I think uh, um, we often miss this point. Um, so yes, clearly farmers are socially reproducing themselves within the domain of capital, but we also know that many farmers are not reproducing themselves at the same level. We have farmers starving, we have farmers under-consuming, we have farmers uh, you know, consuming much less calories. So we should understand that um, you know, the, repro the social reproduction of farmers does not necessarily pass through capital circuits. Uh, clearly, it can, it can be a significant part, but it's not all the story. So what I'm trying to say here is that uh, you might have many cases in which farmers are not producing commodities. Uh, you may have farmers that are producing food, which is not the same. <laughs> uh, it's not the same because, again, uh, the key question is that a commodity... Uh, I mean, many farmers do not produce with the aim of selling what they produce. In many cases, again, their intent is to reproduce a household. Uh, so I have an issue to... So for example, when, when I ask the question, what, what is the, the, the future for those farmers that are unable to join this? Well, in this case, the category of, of petty commodity produ production is useless. Because the majority of these farmers are not producing commodities in the same way as commercial farmers are doing. Uh, and, and this is because, uh, well, capitalism is, a, is an uneven system and, and, and it reaches uh, geographical areas differently. So, for example, in, in the southern part of Uganda, you have the majority of farmers that are still trying to reproduce themselves within capital circuits. But in areas that are geographically remote, out of the course of accumulation, well, you have other dynamics. And, and, and that's why, you know, I'm saying that in this case, when we look at highly commercial zones, agricultural areas, I have no problem in using the notion of petty commodity producers, but they do not use it to define all the categories of farmers. I mean, we, we can discuss this issue um, uh, you know, further on. So, um, again, uh, a key, um, key question out of this is that uh, this contract farming system, to me, is a little bit like the dream of the World Bank, the survival of the fittest. It generates this huge competition between farmers huh? and, and you have the smallest producers ending up again fully indebted, losing their land and being replaced by more commercial farmers that can immediately get in the way by the, the land that has been uh, you know, lost or, or whatever and so you have a kind of a constant turnover right, of farmers so you know like in this sense contract farming is sort of a selection of the of the of the farmers that are the fittest one in the market, right? And and instead it, it leaves behind all those farmers that do not have the means or the instrument to to do this. Um, so again, one one key uh, conceptualization here is the financialization of everyday farming activities, because contract farming, as we have seen introduce the farmers into finance, uh, financial circuits and, and agribusiness circuits, uh, which again um, uh, allow fi finance capital to extract a lot of value. Uh, and that that's explains why perhaps significant part of uh, agribusiness capital is not engaging in production. Perhaps they find it easier to extract value through financialization, right? Or to combine both of them. Um, so I already explained, you know, the, the reproduction squeeze. So basically, again, and this is, uh, you know, I'm writing a paper on, I mean, the paper is already written, but I'm now kind of uh, tailoring these arguments uh, to the land grab debates. And, and so this case study shows that, um, you know, dispossession does not only come from a, a true, a true accumulation by dispossession, right? It's not only the result of primitive accumulation of violence or coercion, and so, you know, which has been perhaps the, the dynamic that has been uh, mostly explored by the land grab literature, right? Because in, in the land grab literature you had a lot of, oh, the enclosures, yes, of course, but clearly this has sometimes ended up narrowing the debate of rural dispossession, which is that is much more complex because you can have what uh, Kojo Amanor uh, defines dispossession from below, right? In other words, it's the market. 
it's not, it's not just violence or coercion of both capital or the state. Mar markets have this possessing element, right? Displacing elements, especially when you are the weak ring in, in global agricultural value chain. A couple of few more points, I, I, I swear I'm going to uh, end soon. Um, but it's interesting because, again, uh, one key feature that's common to both, um, to both um, um, case studies, uh, this is, cannot be seen for it. I, I can tell you, I mean, I, I, I have memorized it. But again, um, the key question is that both regions have moved from a situation of food abundance to a situation of food scarcity. So you see these little beans uh, produced by... I mean, the, the farmers are living a paradox. Uh, I, I say I, I have four acres of land. Uh, how much of these acres do I dedicate to food crops? And how much of these uh, of this acres I, I dedicate to sugarcane? Now, because sugarcane is the money-making business, right, you have... A, Farmers, uh, you know, dedicating it entirely, and this is again also a gender dimension. In it. Because when you, when you have commercial farming coming in, there is always a gender, well, always in many cases a gender conflict. Because women social, you know, establishing social role and symbolic is to nourish the family, and it's not through men giving them money. <laughs> it's their own kind of uh, social responsibility. So when you have uh, uh, all the land dedicated to sugarcane, well, you are clearly creating a situation of food insecurity and you are creating conflicts within genders within it, because of course there is no more the, the previous balance, right? So we have, um, and this is, but this is also connected to the specially invasive character of sugarcane. We have disappearing fruit trees uh, and all rich varieties of food crops, for example. Uh, livestock ca cannot be any more raised because, I mean, I, I have seen, uh, this is funny, uh, in something like 50 interviews I did in Busoga, um, um, it's interesting because I was, um, I was seeing uh, uh, the only farmer that was going in the other direction, so we have seen many farmers going into sugarcane. Um, I, I have seen uh, the case of one farmer, only one farmer, doing, uh, you know, the passing the other way around. But, you know, it was strange because he had to literally walk the cow. <laughs> you know, like, like when you walk a dog, right? When you are in a city, you do not have space, you walk it, right? And the guy was walking a cow because how can you have pastures in the midst of... You have just a little alley in between sugar plantations, right? So for those brave farmers that are seeing the negative effect, they are few, I should say, but exist. Uh, farmers that have, uh, you know, um, kind of um, reverted back to food crops, uh, and uh, but, but again, there is a problem here because um, when you start producing sugarcane, it's not easy to to get back or to to differentiate, uh, you know, your 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 farming system. Why? Well, because a, um, you know, credits, inputs, and anything you need is provided only if you, if you produce sugarcane, not if you produce food crops. If you want to produce bananas, for uh, plant, banana plantain, which, which is mushy and is a puree that the majority of Ugandans eat, you don't get a cent. So, it's, you know, Im imagine that even if you want to send your children to school, you know, the company has made a school, the Madvani school, right? So, if you want to keep your, your, ch your child into the school, you got to keep on pushing and producing sugarcane. So these balances are always kind of complicated if we also add that the main ecological effects of sugarcane product production is deforestation. Now, we, you know, we have clearance of forests. Uh, it has been a process that has taken up to you know, 30 years. Now, the paradox, you know, there have been also activists uh, condemning the company uh, for that. But the paradox is when the smallholders do that. Because when you are a smallholder and you're starting a plantation, you at the same time you need to clear, and you start removing the fruit tree here, uh, the, the, the tree that is uh, is helpful for soil fertility. So huge ecological uh, implications are deforestation and soil degradation. I want to show you just uh, um, uh, you know this combined deforestation and soil degradation has also huge implications for the changing rainfall patterns. Right, you cut all the forests. 
you know, clouds and rains does not come anymore in the same way. There is little you can do. So, you, so it's not a case, not a casualty, that the drought that has hit uh, Uganda last year in 2016, the, the hardest of the last 50 years, uh, has been most, striking, most strikingly uh, in, uh, in Busoga. Because, of course, uh, you know, the environment does not, is no more resilient, to use a word. Already, <laughs> um, just want to show you this because this gives you a sense of what. So you have, you here you have the mixed cropping of sugar cane. You see the smaller one and maize, the bigger one. Huh? So, uh, so the, 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 this is you know it explains how farmers are uh, trying to grapple with the problem of space. We do not have enough space. So what do we do? Mixed cropping. I mean, mixed cropping is an ancient practice. But the, the mixed elements here was uh, cereals and uh, legumes. Uh, so this was the mixed crop, right? So you had a particular cycle in which cereals like uh, sorghum or maize were regularly intercropped with, with legumes, right? Uh, because uh, legumes are nitrogen fixing, and so you had some sort of uh, you know cycle of agriculture. But here you have something very strange, which when I saw it, I was like. That's, that's it, really. You, you see, uh, because basically, you know, because the sugar cane takes 18 months, after three or four months, it's still like that, right? You see the small sugar cane, while maize has already grown. Now, the problem, uh, if you read the... So this sort of advice comes from um, the Sugar Research Institute based in Durban, uh, controlled by Lowe, this company, which is saying, oh, to the farmers, you have this... Uh, problem of space, you don't know if you can dedicate this to sugar, mix them. Now, the paradox is that this system, you know, further, uh, you know, impoverishes the soil <laughs> and also brings together two farming systems which should be possibly incompatible, right? The industrial, you know, uh, the, the farming systems that, you know, enhances a process of industrial production and another farming system that is based on food crops, right? So, strange mix strange, you know, kind of... Um, so when I asked them, so why are you doing so? Of course they were telling, because we are in this kind of paradoxical situation in which uh, we can choose, basically, and the majority of, of, of land is given to, to sugarcane. So again, we have a whole set of um, also health implications. So for example, for the workers that have been uh, employed in spraying fertilizers, uh, or a whole set of, uh, you know, or, or the, the sugarcane cutters. Well, we have seen that there is high incidence, for example, of breast cancer for the workers and all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, skin and, and breathing problems, but not only for the workers, also for the women that live in the surrounding areas. Because this is an intense, that's what we mean when we say it's an intensive uh, model of agriculture, right? Um, and again, finally, there is this question of water, which is something I, I didn't dig uh, a lot in, but uh, just gathering some impressions uh, by, uh, you know, um, I mean, from farmers. Uh, in Tanzania, for example, the Ruhaha River, that's a, a very important river that provides water for one million small holders, is being sucked, uh, you know, uh, uphill. Uh, and so when it gets down, the, the level of, of, of the river is, has gone below you know, of one and one and a half meters. So you see how these huge quantities of water are being used with no control. So basically companies uh, you know, enjoy unlimited uh, rights to uh, water extraction. Right? You see how there is really absence. And the most, uh, most problematic is the, 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 you know, the flows of of toxical elements in other streams and rivers. There was just a, a couple of weeks ago uh, a fantastic uh, piece of uh, investi investigative journalism who showed how Kakina sugar works itself is, is really polluting a, a whole set of rivers. So we see in this, you know, the whole set of uh, implications. Um, so how farmers try to, you know, to, to, to engage in this. Um, well, again, uh, the, as we have seen, there is not much they can do. Um, one legal channel is the fact that through their outgrowers association, they demand constantly for a better price or try to negotiate with the company. But this has not been very effective so far. 
Um, so they have turned this into another strategy, which is the strategy of, uh, of putting fires to the companies. So the question is, okay, so you use your sugar cane, you don't pick mine, I come and burn your plantation, right? Uh, it's very common, um, of course, very difficult for farmers to say it, <laughs> but, uh, but it's very, um, it's very, it's very common. Um, there have been uh, cut, cane cutters demonstrations uh, for better, uh, for better prices and uh, um, better pay. Um, yeah, migrants. migrants, yes, migrant cane cutters. Um, in 2011, and even when I visited the, the, the plantation in 2015, where five people killed it. Um, also, because again, like the, the repression by the state uh, and the security forces of the company uh, in the rural context uh, uh, is enormous, and it's getting even worse in this phase of authoritarian populism under uh, Magufuli regime, which is uh, uh, hitting even harder to critics or uh, uh, you know uh, protesters. Um, and so, so again, like you know, this gives you a sense a little bit of the fact that um, so Ilovo law is uh, is trying to to expand to get more land, and, and this you know in Tanzania, these are mostly in Tanzania. We have uh, also demonstration in uh, in Uganda and malicious fires, but the conflicts were higher in Tanzania. Um, not sure why. Uh, perhaps it comes from the politicization of uh, of Tanzanian farmers who. Again, Nyerere uh, and Ujama instilled some sort of political conscience. So in Tanzania we can say that the peasant uh, is a political subject. We may not say this for, uh, for every um, farmer. And so again, I get back to the idea uh, that I, I, I prefer to see all this uh, question we have been talking about through the prism of agro-extractivism, because as I said, uh, contract farmers contribute to, to extract crops, right, to extract, um, uh, to maximize basically the extraction and the circulation of crops in one area, and then once you have, uh, you have um, saturated one, one cycle of accumulation, well, you move to something else, right, so in this moment I'm following this, um, well, I'm following this, this, this sugar, uh, the sugar frontier, right, because I, I find very useful Jason Moore uh, way of uh, of defining this capitalist frontier as, a, again, an encounter zone between uh, capital and uh, all kinds of nature, including labor. But all this process of encountering is based on, on the idea of cheapening. Everything must be cheap, but cheap not only in the, co in, in, in the sense of uh, money, like it's also cheap politically, right? Because he, through discourses and narratives, you devaluate everything that comes there, and this goes with labor, that's one. As I said, the question of water is paramount. It has no cost, so it's not even cheap. It's zero. <laughs> it's, uh, it, 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 it doesn't even have a monetary value. So uh, that's why I think uh, Jason Moore talks of. So I end up uh, this uh, again this conversation uh, talking about sugarification again, which tries to capture the, the boom of sugar. Which again is not only in the sugar belt or in the sugar boom, but it's about a political project, right? It's about a political project that makes sugar uh, to be the only business in town, right? So if you want to produce something else, well, you 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 are doomed in the sense that you cannot have any sort of support, um, and, and that's why you know that's that's why I, I like the idea of the sugar frontier. Uh, again, because there is not only this question of cheapening this and that, but uh, it's eminently a political process. Otherwise, it would be impossible to... Uh, so, for example, in northern Uganda nowadays, the only projects that are promoted are about sugar. So, while the, sh the southern part of Uganda is all about sugar now, or a substantial part, now you see that this sugar frontier is starting moving north, huh? um, with conflicts and, and, and other uh, elements. Um, something I didn't mention, but uh, perhaps you know, there is also a, a, an explanation for this boom of sugar, and it comes from what uh, June Boras and, and others have termed flexi crops. Um, Say so why, why why sugar was not was not so prominent before? Well, one explanation uh, is is that uh, technologies 
uh, and uh, um, well, enhanced technologies and the multiple fungibility of sugar cane to multiple uses well, allows companies to shift uh, sugar cane from refined sugar, for example, to ethanol. So, for example, uh, we had witnessed low prices on the global market for sugar. Many companies, uh, starting from the Brazilian ones, started to shift, say, the profits in the, in the, in the business of refined sugar is too low. Uh, let's move sugar cane to produce ethanol, which is now much, uh, much more booming and less competitive, right? So, you know, it gives you a sense of how um, the comp you know, it's, it's in the degree of flexibility that we can understand, the, the flexibility of capital, that we can understand, uh, you know, the sugar boom. Right, in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, again, in Africa, it has always been, agriculture has always been a complicated business. <laughs> and so, in this moment, instead, you, you, you find that companies are more uh, secure about their future profit because they can shift it. And also, now there has been a, maxim a process of maximization of extraction of value from every stick of cane. So, you get uh, the sucrose for refining the sugar, but you, you get the bagasse, which is this um, uh, pulp, uh, uh, pulpy uh, vegetable mass out of uh, you know, all, all, the, all the structure of the plants, um, can be used to, to, to produce electricity. Now they call it green electricity. So for companies, they can shift and they can get profits for multi from multiple avenues, right? Not just from refined sugar, which uh, of course is, I mean, it's booming in the country also because um, um, there is a high, high, very high consumer price. So in Uganda you can pay a kilo of sugar up to three dollars, uh, which is very high. It, it makes you understand that, uh, well, not everybody can, can, uh, can, pro can, you know, can, um, can afford it, and that this sugar is also penetrating, you know, it makes me think a lot about uh, <coughs> Sidney Means' argument of how sugar was, in, you know, in, introduced in, in European diets during the Industrial Revolution because workers were paid too little to, su to survive, right? So they needed an extra, uh, you know, an extra uh, energy, an extra amount of energy to, to get to the after, right? That's Sidney Means' argument. He argues that sugar played this particular role in capitalism. So when I, when I see uh, how much sugar is consumed in a, such a poor diet as, as uh, the diets of, of farmers, well, you really see how sugar has become this kind of extra boost that uh, you know, can supplement very meager, but of course um, this is not uh, sustainable in, in, the, in the long run. I mean, this is just a... a shows how the sugar that produces the Kadira ends up in all the uh, bonbons and, 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 and caramel and, 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 and so on. So these are some of the references if you want to uh, give a look at these debates in a more, uh, uh, you know, kind of more in-depth. Uh, that's it, thank you.